<sighs> oh man. Getting in the old sideshow machine. Today is the day. We're gonna go meet Billy Lane. I'm really excited, honestly nervous, because I'm a fanboy and your door's not closed. You can't, what the you can't fuck, the door to save your life, man. That limp-wristed door closing style you've got over there. It's the purse. <laughs> it is the purse. <laughs> Trent's got himself a crossbody bag now that he's a BMW owner. He's like, I bought a BMW, I better get me a fucking, better put my hair in a bun and get a crossbody bag. The bun came way before the BMW. <laughs> and some clear glasses <laughs> that have nothing to do with how he sees. No. They're transition lenses though, so technically they're sun, they're sun glasses. Shout yeah. out flight eyewear. When it's all you got, it's all you got. <laughs> yeah. Which way do I go now? Go. Are we to get there? No. Uh, uh, we, oh, went, we went out that way and made a right. That seems right to me. So we are going to Blockhead shop right now. We're gonna get on some bikes and we're gonna ride down to Melbourne, I think is what it's called. It's down on the coast somewhere to Billy Lane's shop and go meet up with Billy Lane. <laughs> oh, look at this guy. That's right, we're back at Blockhead shop. We're gonna do a little riding today and we're gonna go meet the legendary Billy Lane. We're about to head out, we'll keep you posted. Yo, this is what I'm riding. 2024 CBO, high power edition, no variable valve timing. I think it's the ST CBO. Pretty stoked right now. Ooh, that's a big bike. Yeah. 
this bike is un goddamn real. It is unreal. It is so smooth. I can't even tell I'm doing 95 miles an hour. The motor is so smooth. The power is the power is stupid. It's a stupid amount of power. And it's foam soft. A pipe and a tune on this would probably be just a tire tire. I'm thoroughly impressed and I'm not. I'm not ever impressed by anything that Harley has stock. I love Harley Davidson because you buy them, you buy them to build them. pressure tire warning off. My front tires are 37 PSI. That's pretty good actually. I'm surprised they call that low, but they're both in a higher pressure now. Billy Wayne's right now. I'm freaking out. I think she's quite a bit heavier than the Street Glide. Yeah? I couldn't get her to come up. She just wants to burn out. I might let some air out or something. This is Billy Lane's right here? Yep, he's got his little velocity stack on it, his old chopper zinc timer cover. Oh man, let me get Let's in there. see his Indian Larry footboards? <laughs> yeah. We're made of bronze. Looks like our brass, maybe. Can't tell. Probably it's in the Can't tell. Can't tell. It's pretty cool to see it. Billy Lane rides around. a soft tail. This is what he rides every day. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking out, man. Freaking out, man. Whoa. <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> We're Billy Lane shop right now. Like, dreams come true, you know? And sh yeah, <laughs> crazy. The places that motorcycles take you is, yeah, it's wild. Unreal to me. Unreal. Yeah. That's That's really weird, weird, so I'm getting ready for that. Now. Oh my god. Wow. Every time we race them, so. like I almost all fixed up from being you know, Yeah. Down. And then I, I was getting ready to fix the handlebars. I walked through and I ripped my scab. The last time I, you know, that scab was. Yeah. Let's go down there and look at that. Let's look at this one. Yeah. He's building the frame around it. Let's got to look at this shit. Man. Look at this bitch. This is just imagination happening here. I do some hey. but not near this crazy. Hey. No. This is my kind of shop there. right there. There you go. <laughs> You're racing yourself, dude? No, I, I don't race anymore. I haven't got this guy, uh, Jake Smith, races that for me, and he's going to race my board track bike. I don't deserve to be on the seat. When you see how this dude rides? He's yeah. unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, how fast are you going on the track? Um, he's going in that in the 90s in the straightaway, <laughs> and then the high 70s in the turns. It'll go faster Ooh. than that, but the track can't handle it. The track is, doesn't have the banking. Check out the brakes on it, though. There, there is none, is there? Yeah, no, there's no brakes. <laughs> Man, it's, it's well, you got a lot of modern stuff, to, like the hubs, the wheels, the front end. What is this to the exhaust? So that's the crankcase breather. It normally would just vent out onto the ground on the other side. Um, but the problem with those is you can't get the oil out of the bottom end fast enough. Yeah. So I have a, a valve on the on the pipe, and you're drawing the oil out of the crankcase. That's creating yeah. pressure yeah. effect. Yeah, they were made to go like 2,500 RPM, really max. Really? And um, that goes over 7,000. Really? So you got to get the oil out. 
Wow. So that's like when I we race it, that pipe is soaked on the inside. How do you make that full seven thousand RPMs? Is that got crazy valve springs? A lot of it is the momentum of the motorcycle. You know, um, it's we stay at speed. You know, you hardly off throttle at all. Yeah. So the momentum of the speed, like even when you throttle down, the the rear wheel's overdriving the engine. So um, you know, they just pull that. Up. Yeah, you know, and that, like that bike's three fifty on the nose with um, fuel and oil on board. Really. And it's, almost with one pound difference evenly balanced front and rear tire it's really well balanced wow. like this with the springer and the steel hubs they're 400 pounds so i've shaved 50 pounds off that bike and then i got ceramic bearings in the wheels you know just everything i could do to it to make it lighter and faster yeah. and then these springers you know they don't really do what you need them to do the way we're racing them at that speed so i put a, a little sports different in on it is these, are these different classes, or is it all just one class? No, they're the same class, yeah. but there's, this one has no chance against that. And a lot of guys like to race them. Like, I love the traditional look. A lot of guys want to run them this way, which I get it. But if you want a checkered flag in your hand, you know, you have to, almost have to, to do what I did with that. I mean, the engine, you know, the engine's a big part of it. You know, the weight makes a big difference. You know, that horsepower is weight. What do you, what do, you do with no brakes if you get in a situation? I mean, Which we don't, like, the, like, the track's got those. really good banking. You know, you'll go down to the bottom of the track and turn up the banking and, you know, downshift and... Um, slow yourself down. Yeah, slow yourself down. It'll That banking will slow you down real quick. At the speeds we're running them, if you just need a roll stop, it's it's almost a half a mile, which is a full track length. Really? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> but literally all gas, no brakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Balls of steel is what it is. But that's you know that's how they race flat track forever, um, just with no brakes. You know, um, I mean they slowed them down literally by sliding them. Yeah. I mean, you know they hope lean it down farther. Throttle it, yeah, throttle a turn, and then you know that's how they slow them down was just, you know set them sideways. You watch Buddy Stubbs run the uh, Arizona Mile at like was he like seventy six or something when he went out there? Yeah. Was they let, he was one of the main sponsors, so they let him do one lap. And he went out there and he hit like seven laps and they were trying to stop him. And he was coming to the turn at like 90 miles an oh, yeah. hour in, in his late 70s. And yeah. just that you watch that and you're like, I need to reevaluate myself. That dude's a badass. Yeah, there's, there's no comparison between the mile and the half mile. Like miles are, I mean, I've been yeah. there. We They're go, coming into the 100. Yeah, over 100. Like 125, 130 in the straightaways. Yeah. And then in the 90s in the turns. Yeah, no it's thanks. <laughs> you race flat track at all? Yeah. No. No? I've, I've done it, not raced it, I've ridden flat track. M my problem is I work alone, I got the kids, I can't afford to get hurt. Yeah, know? pulled a leg in half. We did it for a while and then all of our friends kept breaking their legs and their knees and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm 45 too, so I'm not trying to, Yeah. I don't heal from that stuff anymore. I wrecked this all and we, like good. I've been down on a track <laughs> out there on the asphalt what, three times now, four times, and it, you know, it hurts. Yeah. I, I walked away from everything, luckily I walked away from everything. Yeah. It's, uh, it ain't going to get any easier as I get older, for sure. i got almost 10 years on them. Really? Yeah, I'm about 53. Oh, looking good. Low sugar and a uh, weight pile hot, right? That's right. Stay off that garbage. Man, how old were you when you were doing Biker Build-Off back in the glory days? So that was 2001 to 2006, so I was 31 to 36. Yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, that's, that's wild. Like I, that. I watched that probably 400 times, <laughs> just on the TiVo over and over and over again. That's what pushed me to get in the whole industry and everything. It's cr You know, it's, when we were doing it, like, I was just trying to help my business. I never thought it would become what it became. Got other people into the industry. We didn't Huge. know. It. We had no idea. I think Jesse probably knew more than anybody that that would, that would have that effect with him, but we didn't have any idea. And um, I thought now, 20 years down the road, that it'd be a thing of the past, but people say all the time, man, I was 15 watching that now i'm 35 you know and yeah. that's they're my customers and a lot of my friends and um people that i you know work with in the bike industry or encounter in the bike industry so it's really cool i was like 21 and it had a huge impact on my life you know it's Je awesome. i was watching you and jesse like i was like i'm gonna be that right there i'm, awesome. I'm gonna do that and then yeah. i did it and i became good friends with jesse yeah. all i was with him till the end you know and it was it's just wild wild where motorcycles can take it like, yeah the fact i'm standing here right now today is freaking me out <laughs> I, I got started doing this in the 80s really man in the late 80s and there was nothing you know i mean like there was you go to a bike event and the best looking girl was like 190 pounds yeah and you know like, Facts. it's changed so much and, and and everything changed you know i mean back then it's you never would have ever thought like i didn't get into it for money or fame because those things didn't exist it was like this is what i wanted 
my timing was impeccable. You know, I, mean, I couldn't have asked for a better time. Um, I was talking to Dave Perowitz about this recently. Like his generation was a little bit ahead of the curve. Like when I was a kid, when the, the personal computer came out, I was a few years too old to have gotten into the personal computer and be a computer tech guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just by a couple of years. That whole generation that's tech guys was a, is a couple few years younger than me. It's just your timing for everything, which is good because I didn't want to be a tech guy. I'm glad I got it. This is what, what my life took me, but my life was on time perfectly for this. Because what happened the last 20 years ago probably won't ever happen again. Yeah, we, we, we can wish and hope for it, but that yeah. was definitely like the rock star. Yeah. You I guys think, were huge and you set a precedence for everything. Yeah. With, with YouTube, I don't think it's something that would happen again, but that's kind of why we're... Here. But I like YouTube better. If Discovery came to me today and said we want to do a thing with you, and you better pay me really good because we did it for free back then. So I wouldn't do it for free. I'd be saying no thanks. You would do it for yeah. free. Go for. I'll, let me give you a list of names. But God, the marketing had to been that you got out of that had to be right. amazing. Right. And the good thing for me was like when that came along, I was already in the parts industry. I was making really good money making parts, and I was really well known in the bike magazines. So I was really, really well equipped for that marketing to come along yeah. and make money. A lot of the people that were doing it, you know, they didn't pay you so they couldn't make any money. They became famous, sort of, and they had a demand on their time with no way to monetize it. Yeah. Which is the worst situation to be in. Product, Everybody product, wants your time, product. everybody knows you, you can't make a time. So whereas with me, that happened and we were, you know, I was, I was crushing. I was in a good spot. And I learned that from Arlen Ness, Arlen Ness taught me. Before all that came along, I'm like, I want to make money in the parts business. I looked at him and, and Rick Doss. And you remember Rick Doss? I'm thinking, like Rick Doss and some of these yeah. guys were really killing it in the parts business. And talk to them and figure out how to make money in the parts business. Because I never thought TV would, wasn't even on the radar. And this, you know, internet wasn't on the <laughs> radar. You know, I set myself up pretty good. When that all came along, I was in, really in a great spot. So my timing was impeccable. Beautiful. It influenced a lot of people, that's for sure. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't be standing here in, in Florida right now if you weren't on Biker Build Off. Wow. Cool. Mm. I'd probably be building drift cars still and broke as hell. <laughs> Getting one lap out of them. Yeah. <laughs> but I got serious in 96. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it work. And that's when the internet came I'm out. Gonna you know, that, was, like, that was what it allowed me to, yeah. you know. I, said this I was in sixth grade. Yeah. I'm like, I missed the internet. <laughs> I never owned a computer until we started YouTube, and then I had to learn how to use a computer. I was, I was a Lego kid. You know, yeah, yeah. Playing video games exactly. and that shit, you know, like, for that we build say, bicycles and everything. Here in Florida, for that we say, back in my day when this was all yep, orange growth, and that's yeah. not the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I had a very frustrating goal. learning curve in the computer world, for sure. So. <laughs> YouTube was brutal. Our YouTube was brutal in the beginning. COVID was the whole reason we got into this shit. But your videos are really good. Like the videos you guys make, they're Thank awesome. You. We have a professional that makes them for us. I can now. tell. You can tell. Right? Yeah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but where she's uh, she's really good. We've been we're on our second media person now. Her name's June. She kills it. Yeah. She's full time. But it's always had. I had a YouTube for like ten years, and we do videos here and there. But I never thought that it was nothing. You know, it wasn't going to do nothing for me. And this YouTuber came to us who wanted us to build a bike farm when we did. And he's like, "You guys should start a YouTube." And I was like, "I got one, but I don't really do nothing." with it. He goes, "Dude, I'm making sixty five hundred bucks a month on my YouTube." I went, "What?" <laughs> We're gonna get a YouTube going, dude. <laughs> we started running YouTube really hard, which we still don't make nothing off of YouTube, really, but our sales parts-wise and the promotion yeah. and all the stuff we get off of is, is life changing. There's it's a stuff. lot of indirect yeah. you know, monetary upside to you. YouTube itself ain't so profitable, but not now, at least for us. We're still pretty small out on that scale compared to like Blockhead or somebody, but. Well, it definitely like changed a lot of the formula. You know, We're seeing pretty different metrics oh, yeah. as compared to like a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with all the other shit that they're trying, but it's you know levels of playing field. Like you said, if Discovery were to approach you now, it'd just be like, eh, but you have the freedom to do your own thing and you know edit your own stuff. Yeah, like I need to get somebody to do my stuff because it takes me so much time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's a full time job. But we've been moving so much. That's been my big problem. Was I found somebody in Nashville that was going to do it for me, and then we moved here. So I need to get settled. And also, you know, like your your background matters. You know, like yeah. it matters a lot. People notice every little thing. You, I don't know if you notice that. They notice every little Go thing ahead. once in the background. You know, some of the stuff that's in here, like I've had that Crocker since the 90s, and I'm threatening to finish it this year. I threatened to finish it every year for like the last eight years, probably. But, you know, yeah, I've been shooting a video of it since I got it. Well, not since I got it, but since the early 2000s, believe it or not. I have so much old video. I've been in three or four different shops ago. Damn, yeah, just a gold mine of vintage Harley Davidson oh, stuff yeah. here. 
You have a retirement plan at Vintage Charlie Davis. <laughs> this is it, all of it. I have just a, that motor bench alone over there. So. Oh yeah, and then I'm going. We're going to a track in Tennessee. I've been buying like crazy right now because nobody has any money and everybody's selling. So I've been buying. I'm picking up six engines in Tennessee when I go to my race. Two 29s, a 28, a 21, a 36. And Matt's eyes. A 1919 motor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'll, build, I'll build bikes at all of them. Yeah, yeah. All of them. we call it investing in precious metal. What's great, you think about it, I mean, there's no Harley in the junkyard. You know, no Harley Davidson makes it to the junkyard. They, Everything recycle go. everything. It's good press right there. Print it. Like I have, <laughs> I have all this stuff. I have bins of old parts here, and I'm like, I can't throw this out. As soon as I'm gonna need this. Yeah. Every time we have a race, we all know it. There'll be a guy like, oh man, I, I broke this and I can't race. And what happened? We, we I broke this. And you're never gonna find one. I'm like, I got three of them down at my shop. Yep. I'll run down and grab one. Uh, Harley Davidson just gets more value and more value as time goes on. Well, especially these. These things were made, you know. They were farmers, and it's farm technology, so right. they were made just to run forever. In the 45, that's, they were 21 Tractor horsepower, motors. five to one compression, it would run forever. Just keep oiling it, you know? Five to one compression, how does that I'm fire? Doing, uh, <laughs> I'm doing a, 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 a long series on the early, the J model, you know, the, the basically the first Harley, Harley Davidson engines, yeah. before the, everything up to the flatheads, you know, um, because there's, like the knucklehead, we used to ride knuckleheads because that's all we could afford. Mm. Because nobody wanted them. Because before the internet, there was no information sharing. Nobody knew how to make them run and keep them running, keep them, you know, keep yeah. oiling it. You know, once the, some books came out and the internet came out, everybody knew how to make them run, and they you know, obviously are insanely valued now. And the Harley J model is the same thing now, where the knucklehead used to be 20 years ago. That yeah. people don't understand them. They don't, you know, if you're not a good mechanic, it's very hard to ride one. So I've been doing a long series on how you make them run, how you set them up, how you keep them going. Because most cool. people have no clue. Like these guys who are amazing knucklehead and panhead mechanics cannot keep a Harley J run. You know, it's so, on a, such a different level. You it's have to sad. be a mechanic. You know, you know who, there's a lady named Del, Delacruz. You ever heard of Delacruz, all the chicks that are stunt riding? Yeah. It, what's named after a, a chick in like 1929, she bought a Harley Davidson and rode across country and then rode all the way down to like Columbia or something like that. You had to be a mechanic to oh, even yeah. own that motorcycle. And she went across several countries by herself in the 1920s. Yeah. Right. Like she's and a badass. For interstates, that's before I mean, Anything, that's mostly dirt road. roads. Yeah, mostly yeah. dirt roads. Yeah, it's like pulling out a compass and looking south. I don't think any of us here could make that, even know how to work on the bike. How, how did you learn back then? Not. In the 20s? Yeah, there wasn't um, no school. I have a few of the old service manuals. I mean, it's like a pamphlet. It's not even a manual. It just kind of tells you the general basics of how to keep one running. But I think it was just from person to person teaching. You know, really yeah. ride one when it breaks. And they actually did, for the, for the era, they actually did quite a bit of dealer trainings. Like, like in, Willie talks about it in the book. When they're early on, <clears throat> they were bringing on dealers, and they did like they did a lot of dealer education, dealer training. Really. Um, and then a part of it was in World War II, they trained all, like a hundred thousand Harley mechanics okay. because every all the soldiers that were riding them in the war had to know how to work yeah. on them. Well, so you had that there. whole That's a word. That's yeah. A big move. Yeah. They yep. come back home and they know how to work yep. on them. They're like, okay, yep. Yep. Hence the motorcycle club began. But it's neat because. The M8 is a little different, but even definitely through the Evo and the, through the, the twin cam era, the DNA is really the same all the yeah. way through these. I mean, a 45 degree twin, you know, the firing sequence, you know, they learned how to make them leak oil, I mean, seal oil better, <laughs> um, breathe better, like seal the intakes better, and do a few, a few things. But generally speaking, the DNA is still there. These are Indularity. They oh, had a bunch of stuff and they sent these to me. And I'm not, my ST, I have, you know, all the stock stuff. I'm not into the hype. You guys want these for ribbon wheelies or? Yeah. A killer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just won't use them. You know? I was going to shoot them. Wow. You need a tissue? Keep, well, thank you. Yeah, That's you, a, a, you need a tissue? Hard. Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> just about. Cry, yeah. I look, am. At the, look at the moisture <laughs> in the oh, corner. It's hot here. Leave me alone. Oh, okay. okay. It's fucking hot. It's humidity, man. Yeah. Yeah. These are sick. <laughs> Those are sick. Yeah. Thank he sent them to me. I was going to cut them down, put them on the race bike, but. um. Dude. Oh. Yeah, those are badass. Those are rad. He sent them to me the other day. And I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. And then I knew you guys are coming. I'm like, oh, you guys are probably wanting them for something you're doing. So. Oh, man. Because <laughs> I haven't been out west at all. Still the same. It's hot. 
motorcycle scene's a little different. It's a lot younger now, I would say. Yeah. yeah. You mean the Harley, the Harley Davidson scene? Or? Yeah. 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 That's not a, a bad thing, of, though. A lot of young kids getting into it now, especially in Phoenix. 20 to 30 is kind of off an age group on the Harleys. Yeah. It's, it's changing. The stunt riding has made it oh, yeah. real popular with the motors. Like, the dirt bike kids are all coming over. And kids from sport bikes that, you know, normally you'd start on a sport bike, they're realizing now, oh, shit, I can afford a Dyna. You don't have to hurt your back. You actually want to ride it. <laughs> yeah, it'll still it'll hurt you one way or another, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. Especially riding wheelie. It's always been 45 and older. You know, it's kind of catching up now. The kids are getting involved, which is good. So I was looking on my on my um, YouTube analytics. Like my, I have a pretty good younger following, yeah. um, which I was surprised. De definitely, I think my biggest uh, watching segment is I think they're like um, 22 to like 48 or something like that. That's Good. That's the perfect demographic. That's a good right demographic, there. yeah. Yeah, still hungry. Anybody that's in a Harley Davidson in any way, shape, or form at any age is going to know who Billy Lane is. I don't know. You know, it's um. Oh, they I, definitely do. I'm not finding that. Like, they definitely that's do. Good. Everywhere we go. Because I, I feel like a lot of times I'll go somewhere and I'll be talking to somebody and I can tell they have no clue, which is is to me is great. People who know you are is really good sometimes too. But then a lot of times I'll just be talking to somebody and then I can tell they just don't even know. I'm like, oh, that's off, awesome. kind of awesome. Because <laughs> I remember when it was like that. It wasn't that long ago. I got stopped coming out of Publix here and there. This dude rolls up and he jumps out of the front and he's like, block it. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> like, at Publix, man? So I get more of the YouTube stuff than, yeah. than I do. Yeah, believe it or not. Exactly. That's yep. crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I've done five pilots for Discovery and, and History over the years and they always wanted me to play like a villain, you know? like. I just, Ooh, that's good. Yeah. You'd be a good villain. No, I don't want to be a villain. I just want to talk shit and be funny. You know? I'm like, no, 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 no let's do the villain funny. stuff. <laughs> and every, every time it just, it, just, it went nowhere, and I, but I, I wanted to make that happen really bad, and I was like, you know, we'll just make our own. We'll make our own damn TV yeah. show with nobody telling me who I got to be or how I got to be or any of that. That's the best. Yeah. When we used to do Biker Gold Off, you know, they would, they'd come film us, and then you literally... You have no control or anything. You have no idea. They don't show you the playback. They might show you a, a little clip here or there, but we didn't know until three, four, five, six months later they yeah. would air a show. I mean, they always did us right. But sometimes, you know, things weren't really, the chronology was, they mess with that or mm, yeah. they take a clip, you send that out of context. And I never got mad about it, but sometimes it was like, yeah, it's, people would talk to me about it later and I'd be like, yeah, you know, so trying to have a conversation, you can't be genuine because it's like, that's not really how it went. You try and tell somebody what they saw didn't happen, and they they think you know. Right. You, so you was it really a week? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the time part. frames. Everything was all. Yeah. It was all. Because they were cheap as shit. They didn't want to spend any money. <laughs> really. So like the first one we did, um, I think they came like for five days, another time for six days. It was like three weeks the first time, and then after that they cut it down to a week because they didn't want to spend the money. I couldn't build a bike in a week. That, no. that was brutal. It was really <laughs> hard. Like we'd have to. So what we would do is. I would do a lot of the work before they got there. I would know what I was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you did have some pre-planning. Yeah, you know, they would usually give me about a month. Hey, we're going to be okay. there. Well, so you got some time. Yeah, and then I would go to my painter. I'd go to my chrome shop. They all <laughs> and I'd bring them back and say, here, <laughs> you know, in a month, I need Legally. to do some crazy pull-ups and miracles. You're and that's how I did it. I literally have to coordinate everything, yeah. you know, and then make sure I had every last little thing. And the biggest hang-up was always the engine, you know, I was getting engines built or getting engine delivered, and that was always the hang-up, was getting an engine that, you know, wasn't running right or wasn't done right or whatever. Um, and then you got to do it on the fly. Yeah. But With the good the thing about that right show was then you would ride. Then you would ride. You right, know? right. And the riding was what made that show cool, is we'd yeah. actually get on the road and do it. They would try, you know, to get us to create drama at the shop. I'm like, you don't have to create any drama, because that's going to happen on the highway. Like, you're going to get that. Yeah. Oh, true. You squeeze this as hard to get this yeah. done. Yeah, there's going to be issues, yeah. And then I'd like, we'd film, you know, until 10 o'clock at night, and I'd say, okay, I'm going home, and they'd all leave, and then as soon as they leave, I'd turn around and come back and work all night, because then I could get shit done without them being in my face. Because back then, they were still shooting on digital tape. They had to change battery in the camera all the time. You know, the technology was way different. The sound battery and the sound pack would go, and they have to have the sound guy come in and fix everything. So i get them out of my way and then come back and work for hours. It's a lot easier now, yeah. Yeah, all the stuff that, you know. Press button. Yeah, yeah, that's how we always did it. And what was your favorite episode? Andy and Larry one for sure. I mean, that was just, you know. Same. Yeah. Because it was, it was, was you know, Yeah. No, like that was great. Great. It, it was, was a good great episode. episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was cool as shit. You know? Legend, yeah. Yeah. I was such a huge fan of his, you know. Like, I mean, 
like when I met him, I was like, I couldn't even believe I was standing there talking to him. He was, I thought he was gonna be a dick. He was the nicest guy in the world, and um, you know, he was just, uh, he was so cool, and I learned a lot from him. You know, he was 20 years older than me, so like he's almost in a way like a father figure. You know, yeah. like, I, mean, I just looked up to him, and um, he just dealt with everything in such a different way than I did. So, I, you know, it was just being around them and, and doing that. And I had to fight to get him on the show. They didn't want to use him. You know, I didn't know what it was because, like, they used him on Motorcycle Mania 3. You know, he came off really well on that. This was after that. So Motorcycle Mania 3 didn't come out until 2004, but they had shot it, like, a year and a half before that. They were trying to get me to go against another builder, and I just said, absolutely not. Like, I'm not going to do it for a million reasons. And I said, go film, go make a show with somebody else. It wasn't the right thing to do, you know? So I said no, and then they came back, and I said, you know, if you want to do one with me, let's do it with me and Larry. And then they said, okay. Um, and that too, took a lot of work, but anyhow, that was the best one. And the memories from it. And, yeah. And the great thing was, the producer hated me, and hated Larry, but she yeah. took all these great photos and videos, yeah. and sent them to us on a like a CD. After the fact, I have all these photos and videos that really no one's ever seen from that. Oh man, there's a great YouTube video. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna do it, use it this summer because this summer is 20, 20 years that he died. So I'm doing a video about all that, you know, not about him dying, but you know, yeah. about 20 years since he's been gone, and I've been saving all that stuff. Feels like it was yesterday. It really does. Yeah, yeah. It's a quick 20 years, man. Yeah. Never getting caught up. <laughs> yeah, I'm still as far behind as I was back then, for <laughs> yeah. sure. Man, I, I remember when all that happened. It was heavy. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. So if you could do biker build off again, would you? Sort of. I mean, the guy that actually made Biker Build Off teamed up with Jesse with Outlaw TV, and they wanted to do Biker Build Off. Discovery Channel never secured the rights to a lot to that show, so uh, <laughs> they're they're saying they're going to recreate it on Outlaw TV, but they were going to have they wouldn't have me and Jesse and Paul be the judges, oh, wow, um, awesome. and then pick oh, a lot of younger God. builders, you know, um, yeah. do it in a different way. So um, that would be cool. As far as you want me competing in a build off, I don't know. You know, the problem with Discovery, like when they came back with with Monster Garage, they don't when they bring something back, they don't they don't do it better than they did it before. Oh, like Biker Biker Battleground, remember when that came back out? They tried to re pop, basically did like a knockoff version of uh, Biker Build Off. It was Biker Battleground Phoenix, and it was in Phoenix with Dirty Bird, Constance, oh, yeah, yeah. Paul yeah. Yaffe, yeah. and that uh, Cody kid or something. Booty Biker. Yeah, Booty. and it only Booty. went half a season, yeah. and they canceled it. And it was it was exciting, but. It just didn't go anywhere. Cars had already taken over. Cars had taken over Discovery Channel, uh, it seems like. That's a big thing, you know, because um, I'm close to Mike Wolf, and, and the same thing with history, you know, they like they just don't care about motorcycles. They care about cars. They don't yeah. care about motorcycles. And Discovery's kind of the same way. Now they, they own HBO Plus, or whatever it is. I don't yeah. know. But whatever Momoa's thing is on, that's Discovery. On the Rome. Yeah. On the Rome, yeah. So that's really a Discovery thing, but... Him being in it's a whole different thing than anybody yeah. else because he can call the shots there. Anybody staying in this room can call the shot on anything there, but he can. That'd be cool. Jesse, the way he's talking about doing it, I'm curious to see, you know. They were saying they're going to have Outlaw off the ground first quarter this year, which is coming on. Have you ever seen Forged in Fire? Yeah. Like a Forged in Fire biker build off kind of thing? You yeah. guys judging and talking shit about everybody? Yeah. Or? <laughs> Especially now, because now there's so, because of the internet, you know, like there's a bigger pool of people to draw from and talent. I had a contract in 2005 to do my own series, and I got disgusted with Discovery and Biker Build Off. I told them after I did my last, actually before I did my last Build Off, this is it, I'm not doing it anymore. So they gave me a contract, and we went and did all these, like, concept meetings, you know, like, um, spitballing meetings. They went to L.A. like three times, and Silver Springs, Maryland, where they're headquartered. So my idea was what Momo is doing. This is... 2005 was we travel around the country, meet skilled tra craftsmen that somebody's a wood carver or a blacksmith or a glass blower or a leather tooling, you know, meet everybody who does all these different things and, you know, engravers and embellish a motorcycle as you travel around. It's been really cool to see how everybody does something in their environment. They love the concept, but they didn't want to spend the money because it meant traveling. And another one which we have was like to go to like places like, um, you know, underdeveloped countries like Cuba or like Russia travel around and like because there's people there that make shit out of nothing they just keep yeah. it yeah. they keep it running you know and they were like well we love it but we don't want to spend the money being naive and out in the world you think you know big tv channels they got all the money in the world and we just make that happen but well they do but they want to keep it all you know, yeah. that's the problem is they'll allocate like right now so if you're doing a one hour episode you know about 200k you know they'll want to pay you you know 2500 bucks 
yeah. and you're the whole show. This was was my beef with them was we'd be in a room, there'd be 12 of us, the cameraman's getting paid, the producer's getting paid, the AP's getting paid, the, the runner's getting paid, everybody's getting paid, and I'm getting shit, I didn't get anything. Everybody in this room is making 500 to $1,000 today, and well, I'm getting nothing. You. Yeah. I mean, come on, you know, like that was, just, that was the way, and the, because they want to keep that money for themselves. So it can be done, but they, you know, it's, it's greed, you know, it's the greed in that industry, which is why, you know, what we're doing now is yeah. a whole different level because we don't have that, you know. If you're hungry for it, you can. Yeah, it's an equalizer. You guys out there, thank you. Yeah. Now we get to do cool shit and nobody gets to tell us how to do it. I can <laughs> yeah. say cocksucker if I want to. I don't know, can you say? I get beat for every goddamn thing I say. Well, we're on the ad sustainability because. I talk how I talk. Is okay. that like you got like a slap on the wrist? So our pay scale is much lower. What? So we only get advertisement from people that are willing to advertise with someone that says shit. Yeah. We keep it PG-13. In a PG-13 movie, you can say one time. So you'll get that one time. The rest of the time, we'll beef that up. But the rest of it, we let it fly. In a motorcycle shop, that's how I talk. Yeah. You're going to get the real the real deal me. I was not going to PC it up or PG it up or none of that shit. So our pay is very low in the YouTube world. You know, say if you're making... A dollar a view, we're making 10 cents. See, it's funny because I, I was doing that fat boy out there on a video and I was pulling the fork tube off and when I did, the fork tube hit my cup. I had a cup that the oil was draining, the oil, you know, hit mm. it. And I edited it out because I go, mother f***er, you know? And, and so I don't, you know, I don't put any cursing in my videos. So um, I try not to curse at all because I got four kids, little kids running around. So anyhow, everybody probably edited it out because I was trying not to show that I made a mistake, but I don't care, you know? Yeah. But, um, I, I curse too, but I try not to just because I got the kids. My, my kids are all old now, yeah. so and that's why we kind of got the freedom. And I got a lot of people come up all the time like, oh, we put our kids to bed to you, and they love watching your YouTube. I'm like, it's, it's like, not no. really for them. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, no. it's not really, you know, like, well, oh, I don't really think I'm the influence <laughs> that your six-year-old needs right yeah. now. But, but yeah, we, we try and keep it PG-13. That's where I'm going to say. And that's only because we've had so many kids come up recently. Dude. When we first started, I was Damn. just... I was all going off, you know, my mouth was just out of control. I was in yeah. a motorcycle shop talking how I talked. Ooh. First time I had like a little seven-year-old girl come up and she was like, mention something in a video. I'm like, like oh. I'm like, ah, I gotta clean okay. up my mouth. Maybe I shouldn't tell those <laughs> jokes anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we're just shooting some shit. And people yeah, I don't think about the like, range. Why are you keeping it? Why are you censoring it? Keep it real. I'm like, well, we're keeping it pretty real in fair scope to what YouTube is today. But at the same time, yeah. you're not the only one watching it, dude. You gotta get yourself a 2002 Dyna FXDX suspension in a seat, yeah. and you'll just be, and then you do it. You can end up with a little bit of titanium, electric titanium in the body. I already got that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. First time I ever rode a, a bagger, I got um, titanium plate in my right wrist. First really? time I rode one. You can get a rad video of you flying over the handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I you guys want to sit on the cruisy pitch? <laughs> <laughs> I the guy behind me had a GoPro on his bike, but it was aimed high. It had vibrated up, and so it only got a quarter of a part of it because it was pretty rad just but. your feet kind of flying through yeah. the air <laughs> exactly and he also you know tried to not to hit me because you know he didn't have any brakes so he's right behind me we have people like you've got a lot of people that are my age and older like guys in their 50s and 60s that are getting into stunt riding now in harleys and they're all excited they're like yo i'm getting into this i bought a pit bike i'm practicing what what's your piece of advice i'm like stop <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I'm like, that's cool you're getting into it, but man, you will you will get hurt. Oh, yeah. You yeah. will get hurt. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. Like, the broken bones, they are going to happen. The ACL and the MCL and the feet and the neck and the, the spleen. The spleen and the collarbone, the collarbone, the sternum, the scapula. Collarbone again. And the yeah. Bangles. yeah, two different The third times. collarbone, you know. It's it's like a a <laughs> it Is it worth it? There's a price to being cool, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> Go break some limbs. Be Have bionic. Your time, yeah. <laughs> Just quit your job, get your priorities straight, everything will be fine. You ain't going to work on Monday if you're going to the lot on Sunday for the first time. You ever, you ever rode a pit bike, like a 110? Yeah. yeah. That, that's that's where you learn at. You want to start with a 110 with a street tire on the back and learn on that, because it's going to hurt you, but not as violently. Right. And then once you've got that dialed, then you go to like a Grom or a Monkey, and then you go to a Harley Dinn. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys are buying Harley. What am I learn how to ride wheelies on this? I'm like, no, you're not. Start on that little dude over there. You make it look easy, and that's the thing. And they think people think, oh, everybody's doing it. How hard can it be? It's it's really, hard. Yeah. Yeah. It took me six years to scrape my fender. Six years of riding a lot before I finally figured out. And then it, it was you know months on a pit bike. I, I finally got on the pit bike and learned, and then I could scrape fender and do all that stuff. But I've also been doing it for 
15 plus years. Yeah. It looks easy, but I also get hurt still. I started learning on the ground, and then I saw all the injuries that everybody around me was getting, and I was like, I'm done. No, it'll get you. The, the little ones will get you. I just wiped out my monkey at our bike week event and crushed the whole left side of a fully custom-built Honda monkey that's worth about 25 grand, you know, and just... I went back to hand drag and the lot was so slick as soon as I went back, the back tires went you shot up from underneath me and then I walked funny for my ankle still clicks every time I step down. Uh, here we are, I just did one. <laughs> you know I'm not doing it, you know. <laughs> it'll work sometimes. All right, so this has been uh, Upside Down. And we're going to continue the episode. Uh, which parts that are going to go on something or I'm going to get rid of. And a lot of, I still don't even know what's in a lot of that stuff, but um, just, yeah. That crate. I do all the job <laughs> conversion. Um, yeah, it's all hand. I haven't made all that. I at least couldn't get it all cleaned up, but this is, you know, why I like, kind of weld and fabricate. So, like I'm doing these cool hand bikes. So these are, so these are Harley Davidson flatheads. Yeah, these are dope. I was looking at this. Yeah. I do all the rear valve conversion. Um, I like this. Yeah, it's all hand. I hand make all that. You know, like I still do it all by hand instead of using CNC. I, I made that frame. I hand make all the frames. Um, I make the cylinders, um, and they're really neat. You know, so like Al Crocker was doing the Indian overhead valve, and there was that. Have you heard of the Coslo? Coslo Harley Davidson. The guy named Andy Coslo in Chicago. And he was taking Harley VLs and the Harley UL flathead, the big flathead, and doing overhead valve conversions on them. He only probably made a handful of them, but that's what that, basically what that is, you know. So it's 68 cubic inches. Um, they're not running up on it. They run really strong. And the bikes are super light. They're only, you know, uh, 475 pounds. You know what? I, I got out of the knucklehead and head game because everybody else was in it. You know, I got, because of YouTube, I quit taking customers, you know, I'm just kind of doing my own thing. Yeah. I'm doing these and I'm doing my own thing. I don't need the work, you know, I don't need the money. You know, YouTube's taking care of me. It's great, man. And, you know, that, these are cool hand engines. Um, so you're doing these in-house, huh? Yeah. And see, like this one, I, 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 I relieve this, I haven't relieved these cylinders yet. Depends on that one over Yeah, there. so I got to relieve them. You know, I have like all the boring bar, sun and hone, everything I need to do. But I, I don't have a proper engine room. I need to get a, you know, when I buy my building in Tennessee or build it. Like I can build all my own engines. I can do my valve jobs. I can do everything here without having to reach out to anybody else, you know, which is really nice. As they get older, you know, I can just come in and do whatever I want and I don't have to deal with people. So, you know, um, it takes time to get there. But I just... But like, you know, like right now is a good buying cycle. I've been buying everything up because there's no money in the market. 57s and 44s. Not his. Um, you see that? But you couldn't get him to shut the machines down now to make those for you. Huh. So I, I know you're looking for <laughs> Yeah. Are these caps? They tend to be cut off and That's what, you remember his like six shooter? Like, yeah. Yeah, those are the, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. They tend to be all cut off, you know, so I don't have to, I used to, when I started making them, I was literally going to a gun range and scooping them up off the ground. Yeah. And then Stamping them? I made it up. No, they just, oh. they had the manufacturer, they said like Remington oh, okay. or whatever yeah. in them. And the, the original ones. And then I made an arbor, I put my lathe in, I had a cutoff tool and I just part them all off and have stacks of them. And then um, I made a tool to knock the used primers out. And then I was using live primers, but I, I cooked the live primer in vinegar and water to okay. make them inactive. Because I was originally putting them on with real good primers and the oil tank would get hot and the primers would pop. Like, bop, bop. Oh. Scared the shit out of people. So I um, <laughs> ended up, uh, you know, knocking the old primers out, cooking the new ones and putting them in. And then eventually, you know, we got it made with my name in them because, you know, it's yeah, like we, it we got sense. to that point. So anyhow, I'm going to go back into the parts business next year. Really limited. And, you know, we'll do like limited runs and stuff. But like, do excellent customer service. You know, like really yeah. nice packaging. That's what people want. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we send handwritten notes with yep. ours, and people yeah. just love that. Like they eat yeah. it up. That kind of thing. Yeah, they want a, a personal experience. You know, like yeah. that's what I learned is uh, over all these years. One day, I, you know, I when we got on TV and we're real popular, I was one day at a show with Indy Larry and Paul Cox, and we're walking. I'm like, dude, Larry goes, can you believe that people respond to us this way? I mean, it was crazy. You know, I'm talking about like 2003, 2004. Yeah. And I was like, no, I've never, I never got it. And then, you know, one time we were walking through a show and I said earlier, I said, I think I get it now. You know, like it's, people are so passionate about their motorcycles. Like, oh, yeah. You know, because look what we're riding. We're riding, you know, we wanted a, a you, you could ride a BMW, 
Right, KTM. If you right. wanted a good motorcycle. Yeah. 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 That wasn't here. I thought it was cheap. You buy quality, you buy a Well, yeah, you buy something else. Yeah. So you buy self-respect, though. They're so they're so passionate about it that they're willing to ride an obsolete motors and obsolete design, and it's the passion about the motorcycle that makes them care about this and be willing to spend the money and everything yep. else and um you buy you it know, to build your build yourself your self-image yeah. you know the whole you, you walk down main street on any bike event every bike's 20 to 30 grand yep. 40 grand every every one you walk past you know think about it like, yep. you walk past 10 bikes 15 bikes a half million dollars you just walk past yeah right well, easy now so we're okay. gonna build 20 and then they weren't they didn't perform is like that open top people. end on it too mm -hmm. the top end's just open yeah they didn't know how to cool exhaust valves back then. So, like, so I'll show you. So this is, this is called intake over exhaust. The intake valve is facing down and the exhaust valve is facing up. They didn't know how to cool the exhaust valve. The exhaust valve would get hot and break. So they put the intake valve right over top of the exhaust valve. So when the cold air came in, it'd blow across the face of the exhaust valve mm -hmm. and cool the valve as the air, air would come in. That was the design all the way up through 1929, you know, because they didn't know how to heat treat metal. So when they started making overhead valve stuff, that's 1934. Um, yeah, they ran that, everything. This is the like flathead design, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what the flathead was? No, like this is flathead where the two valves are both facing up and the head's flat. So this is preceded that, you know, the, like this design is European. So in the United States, everything from the early 1900s up through like 29 was mostly intake over exhaust design. And um, except for Indian, Indian changed because they hired a European designer. But that's like the one on the right is a 1914 Indian. That's intake over exhaust. You can put that, and you know it's really similar to this because they would put them on a train, say go to the Kansas City board track and race, and Harley Davidson would see what Indian was doing. Indian would see what Harley Davidson was doing. They'd go back to the factory and say we got to change this because yeah. you know we're having this problem and they're faster, you know, whichever company it was. And that's how they learned from each other, you know, Flying Merkel, all those companies, you know, they didn't, they were communicating by telegraph, right? So they didn't know. Um, so they would literally put them on a train, take them back to the factory and des develop them, develop them, develop them, you know, and... Um, you know, like it looks like the yeah. Industrial Revolution. Yeah, really steampunk, you know. Yeah. Everything's moving, you can see everything moving when they're running. Um, yeah, it's wild, like the external push rod right there. Right? Yeah. And that's how they cooled everything. You know, it was like, okay, just let the air cool it because they didn't know how to yeah. get oil up there to control it with oil. How, how do you get parts to rebuild one of these? Is people still making aftermarket stuff You hoard, them? and then there's a company <laughs> called Competition Distributing that makes some of it. Yeah. Uh, but you hoard a lot of stuff. and like you, know, you bend one of those push rods, what do you do? Like competition, like all these are, um, so these are originals. Like those nickel plated ones are re reproduction. The, the company makes a lot of the parts that are missing. Yeah. Down there, nice and tight. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Like, this is the 1912. I was telling Matt, it's super, super rare, like, ungodly rare. I don't have the cam cover, but a friend of mine has a 1912, so he's going to let me borrow his cam cover. Yeah. I'm going to, I have a small foundry. I'll just sand cast the cover, machine it, and, oh, wow. and make make one, because you, you'll never find another one. Yeah. You know, you just, you'll never find it. So is this, instead of, like, a hydraulic tappet, does it run off of a spring? Is that what that is? Yeah, it's just a spring, and it's just, um, like, solid lifter, you know. And it's just sitting against that. Here. <laughs> still not that bolt pattern either. <laughs> I noticed that the bolt That's pattern's nice. looking different yeah. each one. Yeah. Wow. So I'm looking at that wide gap right there. Oh, yeah. It's that one similar, but it's not the same. Yeah, yeah. like the cast aluminum, like this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So these have, it's not an oil pump, it's a timer. It's just a rotating valve that allows oil in the engine. And, sure. um, like, these are adjustable. You adjust it with your left hand grip, and that's a big problem with these is oil control. That one isn't adjustable, and then they were having problems with them, so they made the adjustable pumps later. And then this is 12, it doesn't have any pump at all. That literally has a sight glass on the tank, and you turn a, um, uh, like a little valve, okay. and you watch the oil drip in the sight glass, and that's how you oil that engine. And like, really? that's why the wristwatch became, you know, like the wristwatch, like from locomotives and early vehicles, like you have to time your oil drip. Every so you second. do like you do like six a minute. So like every oh, okay. ten seconds, you're gonna drop a little drop of oil go. Holy shit! And that's kind of how you're gonna do it. And then if you're running really hard, you you need extra oil. You had this pump, and you just fucking you know give it a slam, and it would shoot squirt oil onto the flywheel like extra oil. Yeah. Pretty pretty crude and neat, but um, it's kind of have to listen these to are the motor. Yeah, yeah. listen are to these? it. You'll feel it. Feel it tighten up. Yeah. Literally just squirt it with oil. Wow. And it'll loosen right up. And it's so crazy. you got an oil tank and two gas tanks on this, correct? Right. So like when we race them, I 
I'll fire it up on the stand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sh- squirt it with oil, fire it up on the stand, and then I'll drain all the oil out of the crankcase. Then we'll go run our heat. We usually run two pace laps. We start off at a pace like Indy cars and NASCAR. Um, so you with get no a, oil. With no oil. Okay. But by the time we've done, and then we run usually six laps. So by the time you've done two pace laps and then run six laps, you'll bring it in. There'll be three, three, four ounces of oil in the bottom end, which is too much. You imagine running a Harley Davidson today for two laps with no oil in it? Yeah. You might get That'd away. That'd be the only once. two laps. Yeah. You might get away with it once. Uh, man, not the rings. Yeah. But Remember the, that piston we looked at yeah, today, yesterday? Yeah, that one got away with it, like didn't that. it? <laughs> See, the, like the Indian on the right has a sight glass at the bottom, and all you want in that bottom end is enough. You just want to see that there's oil on the flywheel. And that's it. That's huh? all you need is enough for the flywheel to sling it. You're just splashing it. It's just a little splash. So a couple ounces. Well, how, how did it get oil to the, did this spray the pistons? Did they even oil the pistons back then? Um, just the underside. It just, it just slings it from the underside, and then that one line you see is oiling the front cylinder. They always had a problem the rear cylinder would pick up all the oil sling and the front wouldn't get as much. Mm-hmm. So the Indian put a, a oil feed to that front cylinder to feed it. And like when you, now these, the hardest thing to find on these is cylinders. The front cylinder is always gone. You find the rear cylinders all the time because the front ones wouldn't get enough oil. They get cooked. Or, yeah. Like a, a set of cylinders for these is about two, two grand for a nice set, three grand for a really good set. And then you're- You didn't film that, you didn't see that reaction. <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm not compl- I'm not complaining about anything for a Harley ever again. Like yeah. this, this set right here on this 12, that set of cylinders is probably about five, six grand for that set of cylinders. That engine's um, <laughs> some somebody offered me 20k for it recently, and I told them no. Like, oh yeah, you're Believe a little low. De- definitely. Yeah. In case you you guys missed it on like the that, camera, there's, there's a lot of money sitting right. Those oh, yeah. cylinders, those light gray ones, those are the ones you made, right, Billy? Yeah. That, so those are those are Crocker heads. House. Those are actually the heads off my Crocker. Really? When I bought mine, I had um, yeah. I, had, I bought an extra engine with it, another partial engine, and a bunch of other parts. And so that's the heads that were actually on my bike. And I built those cylinders and um, building that motor, you know, to run. You machine those cylinders and everything. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Nice work. It's just a big ductile iron blank. Yeah. And um, it cuts like dude, it cuts like balsa wood it's crazy how nice really? it yes. and then you don't have to run a sleeve in it you just you bore it you hone it and you run a piston right in the ductile iron that's what they make like um nitro top fuel cylinders out of really super strong it, it, it cuts that easy and holds super, up to the rings yep. well wow. unbelievable how's it look good beautiful T- today for me if you've heard any of me stutter which you never hear that and <laughs> i'm usually just you know fluidly talking shit but this is an icon, like an ab- absolute honor today for me. This is huge, huge day for me. This is huge for me. This is amazing. Thank you for bringing me out here. Damn it. Blockhead, if you guys aren't following Blockhead Moto, go follow him out. Billy Lane, Chopper Zinc. If you don't know who Billy Lane is, you haven't been on a motorcycle for more than two minutes. <laughs> he is the man. He is one of the godfathers of the scene. Absolute icon and one of my idols, and I am super happy to be here. Play back that part where... Billy handed him the risers and he did this little squeak. Yeah. That's probably my favorite part of the day. You got me right there, man. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a big deal for me. Real, real, real talk. <laughs> Billy, what do you got going on? You know, I'm just sitting here uh, getting everything ready for my races. You know, we do the Vintage Motorcycle Racing Sons of Speed and, you know, build custom choppers for people and, you know, enjoy meeting guys like you. I mean, um, yeah, I follow you on YouTube, so it's cool to see your stuff and, and uh, you get the balls to do stuff I don't have balls to do <laughs> anymore. In here every day slaving at it, man. That's it. Amen. Never getting ahead. Never getting ahead. Ne- ne- never ahead, always behind. That's the key. Thank you guys for watching. Follow these guys. They're killing it. It's cruiseoriginals.com. For every $5 you spend, you can buy it, win a motorcycle. Too much air in it. Yeah. Oh, we're good. We're good. 
I gotta say, I really like riding the street glide a lot better. I feel like I'm on a much smaller bike. It feels a lot just more compact and nimble. Pipes. Where are we going? Down to the beach. Walk by the beach, boy. We're going turtle fishing. Turtle fishing? Is that legal? Huh? Is that legal? <laughs> Can you fish turtle? Look, a shoebie. Bunch of shoebies over here, dude. Yep. <laughs> I can see why you left California, dude. It's not bad. You're right here. It's chill, right? Yeah. You do this in uh, you San Diego. Can't even walk on a beach like this in California. Not you a bit. Slam with people. It would just be. You wouldn't be able to put a blanket down. No. Uh, on the would... weekend, it's kind of rough, but no matter what it is. San Diego beach. It's yeah. just be fucking ten thousand feet more. Always. Yeah, the sand isn't as soft. It's like a proper. That's a sea turtle's nest. That's crazy. Turtles lay eggs there. Check this shit out. Son, living a rabbit. Shut down at 35. No living a mountain on this guy. Yeah. Almost back 
back to the shop. We are almost done for the day. I'm ready to get off the bike. I do need to at least get one good wheelie on this thing. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you see that? Yeah. I fucking scraped it. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. Dude, I scraped it. No, I don't think I got the scrape. You were a little far, but I got it. Oh. <laughs> I scraped it. Crazy. That was a clutch up right there. Yeah. I think it was the right uh, pipe. Yeah, just a little kiss on the right side there. Woo! A little, little zing right there. Who else has scraped a brand new Harley Davidson bone stock? Bone stock bagger. I don't think you can do that on any other bagger out there. Like a 23? No, not going to happen. The suspension is not there. It took me a seat bounce and like a good stop, but that thing clutched up on me really hard. Hard, dude. Yeah. What? See the, my, my point of view of it. Oh man, we gotta see the video. One hell of a ride today. Thank you, Matt from Harley Davidson very, very much for making this happen. Blockhead, Chris over here. Blockhead's already gone. He's picking up parts so I can beat one of his bikes up tomorrow. Man, that is a beautiful bike. Beautiful, beautiful bike. I think I am sold on the Street Glide. It just feels nimble and really, really fun. And my God, it rides really, really nice. All oh, my stuff's in there. Yeah, they, you might need to give them a perspective of how wet we are. Yeah. Like, you, know, it, you don't have enough hair, but. That last little bit got a little rough there. Right? Yeah, I got a little sweaty. I got a little moist out here, but man, what a good time. Oh, she's, we won't even talk about that, but here we go. Thank you once again. Thank all you guys for watching. Like, subscribe. Tell seven friends, go to cruiseoriginals.com, buy something, you can win a motorcycle, and all that good stuff, and there's a whole bunch of big crazy shit to come. Thank you very much. Peace!